All right, hello everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming today to our presentation. My name is Kim, and today I'm joined by my partners, Sana and Waris. Our project is Accessible Investigative Journalism, where we've been developing a data science solution to navigate Canada's largest corpus of government documents. Our project partner is the Investigative Journalism Foundation, which focuses on public interest journalism through driving transparent data-driven reports as a mechanism for strengthening Canadian democracy. A defining feature of the IJF is the databases that they host, which cover key information such as lobbying data, political donations, and financial reports. On top of hosting these databases, the IGF is committed to improving their accessibility so that people from non-journalistic or non-political backgrounds are able to easily navigate and benefit from the information. For our project, we'll specifically be focusing on the Open by Default database, which is composed of all of the request statements sent to Canadians to the government under the Access to Information and Privacy Act. With over four and a half million pages, it's currently Canada's largest corpus of publicly available government documents, and it acts as a mechanism for transparency with the government. Each of the requests um, represents requests for information sent by Canadians who can be investigative journalists, civil rights lawyers, legal scholars, or just a regular citizen. With the way that the OBD is structured on the website, each entry consists of a request statement submitted to the government, such as the one shown here. And the requests can range from seeking informal email transcripts to official contracts and everything in between. Each request is then paired with the return documentation by the government in a PDF format. While Open by Default hosts an abundance of valuable information, there are several challenges that limit its accessibility and value as a tool for IGF journalists. The first challenge being poor data capture. So within OBD, most documents exist as non-native PDFs, which are scans of physical documents that exist within government archives that have no embedded text. As a result, um, these documents must be, uh, these documents must undergo machine learning models to extract and identify the text like shown here. As you can see, while the uh, PDF on the left is readable, the extracted text is incoherent. Another challenge within OBD is the search methodology. So currently OBD uses keyword search, which looks for exact keyword matching between user queries and the data within OBD to retrieve relevant results. So essentially, documents with a higher density and prominence of the keywords will be ranked higher than others, which fails to consider the intent and context of the question. So for example, if we were to consider a question where we want to know about Indigenous people and whether they're included within pension plans, we might enter a keyword search like the one shown here. As you can see, one of the top search results um, one of the top search results discusses uh, tuberculosis in Saskatchewan First Nations um, due to its uh, high density of the word indigenous. Okay, so the overarching goal of our project is to essentially improve data capture, as well as make the OBD data set easily navigable and searchable. So we want to make the OBD data set not only accessible for a wide not only accessible for non-political or non-journalism background people, but also for a wider range of users. So um, we employ data-driven tools um, to um, uh, for in this project. So um, as you can see here, the broad objectives of our project, they entail uh, improving data capture, which essentially means extracting more meaning out of the text. Uh, then we enhanced search performance um, which is essentially for improving information retrieval and then finally enable a user um, interaction. Um, and here is an overview of our timeline for the project. So first step consisted of improving optical character recognition or OCR, um, which uh, allows us to extract text from the PDF documents. Then we constructed a vector database, which enables uh, semantic search um, and allows a user to search more efficiently. Then we moved on to topic modeling, which uh, consists of extracting themes uh, to classify document metadata, and then um, onto the advanced search, where we combine where we combine semantic search and traditional querying methods, such as keyword search, and then finally we built our RAG 
retrieval, augmented generation, or RAG LLM pipeline. Um, and this allows us to essentially speak with the data set. So what does that look like? Um, this is sort of what we envision our final product to look like on the IGF's website, um, where a user can essentially enter a query um, and talk to the data set. So for example, if you were to enter a query such as this, you would expect a response um, generated by the LLM. So to work towards our first goal of improving data capture, we worked on experimentation with optical character recognition, or OCR, which involves using pre-trained machine learning models that are able to essentially read the scans of documents and extract the text within them. In our experiment, we compared traditional OCR services to large language models that perform OCR. Ultimately, through the experiment, we determined that Amazon Textract uh, was the best OCR tool, extracting 40% less non-real words compared to the original methodology that was being used. 31% um, more words in general. So this means that Amazon Textract was able to identify and extract more words. And then overall, more generally, improved extraction quality upon manual inspection. So given all of the text extracted by our OCR methodology, we're going to be moving on to building a vector database. Vectorization is the process of converting text data into numerical representations so that they can be processed by machine learning models. The goal when vectorizing the text into their numerical formats is that the format preserves the semantic meaning of the text. We're specifically working with embeddings, which are a form of vectorization that represent numerical representations of words or phrases where semantically similar words are mapped nearby in the embedding space, as you can see in the diagram on the slides. To achieve this, we use transformer-based embedding models, which understand and represent the words within the context that they are presented in. So that can be a sentence, a chunk of text like a paragraph, or a page to several pages. These models are ideal for vector for vectorizing entire documents and representing the words within the context that they're used in, rather than just having a representation for a word um, in isolation. So finally, the vectorization of the OVD dataset essentially converts the text into uh, numerical character characters that the uh, computer can understand. Uh, and these vectors, they're very important for later steps of the project, such as uh, topic modeling and labeling, semantic search, and then finally for our RAG LLM pipeline. So overall, we analyzed a few different transformer models, uh, as you can see here. Uh, we were mindful of the size of the parameters um, for each transformer model, such that we could balance the computational performance and efficiency in this process. Um, so some of the models that we tried include BERT, distal BERT, uh, and these are encoder only uh, transformer models that, can, um, that are only good for understanding text um, tasks. And then we also tried end-to-end -end transformer models, such as Flan T5 base, um, which can also generate new text. So to compare these different embedding models, we looked at some qualitative and quantitative metrics. So qualitatively, we used UMAP plots, which are essentially visualizations that reduce and plot the embeddings in two dimensions and serve as an initial impression to scope out how the potential topic clusters are. Using these UMAP plots, we can look at the most representative words and documents for each cluster and topic. And quantitatively, we can look at semantic coherence, which calculates how strongly interrelated words and documents are within a topic. Semantic exclusivity, which looks at how different, um, how semantically distinct different clusters are. And then finally, density-based clustering validation, which is a commonly used tool to evaluate um, cluster quality using cohesion, separation, and noise-based metrics. So like mentioned earlier, an intuitive way to understand this is through the UMAP embedding visualizations. So when plotting the embeddings in 2D, we expect to see clustering and dense blobs when a model has successfully captured the meaning of our text data, where semantically similar texts are clustered together and semantically distinct ones are separate. So this is just a dummy representation where you can see that there are distinct dense clusters on the UMAP plot, which each belong to very distinct topics. In reality, however, um, clustering may not be as dense, but this is just an example where we've uh, manually curated a data set belonging to five different organizations. As you can see, some embedding models will perform uh, 
better, where there are distinct distinctions between the different organizations, while the one on the right, there's some overlap between the different organizations and topics. So um, finally, we decided that our best performing model was BGEM3. Um, it has some key features, such as uh, being able to handle multilingual text, as well as having a large um, uh, token uh, context window. Um, so we use BGEM3 to vectorize the entire corpus of OBD, um, which was then stored into a Postgres, Postgres database with a vector extension. So um, here we have an example of what a tuple in the, um, in the database would look like. Um, for each file, we separated um, the text content into smaller chunks of 1,024 tokens, uh, which is about a page. Uh, and then you can see for each entry, we store the document number um, or the file ID, uh, the chunk ID and the content, and then finally the embedding itself. And using this, um, this essentially enables a user to query the vector database using semantic search. Uh, which means that you can uh, input a keyword or phrase, which is then transformed into a vector and then it's matched against the pre-built index of our documents. Um, and the matching is done based on essentially how similar um, the direction of two vectors is, which is uh, measured using cosine similarity. And then finally, the user will retrieve however many um, similar items that they want um, using semantic search. So here we have a small demo. Um, prepared for you of what vector search looks like on the on our app. So as you can see, um, essentially the user can input a query. Uh, they can then select however many search results they would want. So in this case, 20, and they filter based on the date. And then when you hit submit, um, you get top 20 sources that um, are best matched to the query. And then you're also presented with links to the IGF website for the document and you can update the query and then you can also filter based on however many um, organizations you would like and yeah, that would update the query results. Okay, so given the embeddings of the full OBD database, we moved on to applying topic modeling to all of the documents. Because our data set is quite large, diverse, and unlabeled, topic modeling is an ideal approach for synthesizing meaning from the text where we can extract topics um, representing the content that's being um, discussed within the OBD database. Topic modeling is essentially a method that's used to discover semantic patterns portrayed in a text corpus by automatically identifying topics that exist inside it by returning summary sets of key terms and documents returned by the um, files in the database. The process uses statistical modeling, which applies unsupervised machine learning methods to analyze and identify clusters or groups of similar words within a body of text and can be used to identify the most prominent topic in a set of text, as well as secondary, tertiary, and so on relevant topics. Topic modeling allows us to generate more intuitive document labeling, where documents will be assigned to topic tags that reflect the high-level topics represented in its content. This allows us to have more nuanced descriptions of the OBD dataset. As mentioned earlier, we've taken our documents and broken them down into text chunks of 1,024 tokens, which allows us to get chunk-level topic labels, which can further be aggregated to get document-level topic labels, as well as database um, level topic representations. This will also allow us to enable topic search where documents can be filtered by their topic tags. So here's a visualization of ideally, um, or how a file's content is originally displayed on the left for the IGF website. You'll have the file name and the organization under which it was released, followed by the content. And then on the right, we have what it would look like with topic labels. Um, as you can see, the topic labels are much more descriptive and intuitive than just the organization label. And you'd also be able to have the data for which topics are represented in which chunks of text. The topic model that we use for our project is BERT topic, which uses transformer-based embeddings. So in our case, we got our embeddings from BGEM3 to capture the semantic meaning of the documents. It then reduces the dimensionality of the embeddings and clusters the documents um, by extracting topics that identify representative words and documents for each cluster. 
Using these representative words and documents, we can generate topic labels through two main methods. The first one is by automating the process using the OpenAI API to use um, GPT-4 Omini to assign a topic label. And the second method is to present these words and documents to the editorial team at the IJF, who can come up with representative topic labels given their domain expertise. So on the slide, you can see the top 10 words that were generated by our topic model for a particular topic. And this is the label that OpenAI generated for it, which is quite relevant. When evaluating the different configurations for our topic models during experimentation, we examined coherence scores, which measures how semantically consistent the top words in a topic are with each other. A high coherence score indicates that the words in a topic are closely related in meaning and context, making the topic more easier to interpret and intuitive. Here we use an elbow plot to visualize how coherent score changes as we increase the number of topics that is being returned by our topic model. And for this particular sample, you can see that 90 would be the ideal number of topics as that's where the improvement in coherence score plateaus. Using our final topic model, we can assign a topic label to each text chunk and store that in our PG vector database along with the other data. And lastly, with the final set of topic label tags, we can also enable topic level search, where documents tagged with search topics are returned. And while we haven't had a chance to fully implement this yet, the search mechanism should return the exact chunks within the document that have been tagged with the search topics, given that one document can have several chunks with different topic labels. The final component of our project was the building of our retrieval augmented generation large language model or RAG LLM. So to begin, uh, we'll go over what a traditional large language model is. So these are machine learning models that are capable of understanding and generating text. So a common example that you may know of is OpenAI's GPT-4, which is trained on huge sets of data to perform various natural language processing tasks. RAG LLMs, in contrast, enhance the response of these large language models by retrieving relevant context to the question being asked. The advantage of this is that RAG LLMs provide up-to-date and more accurate responses, not, which means that they are not limited to the training data of the large language model. In addition, RAG LLMs mitigate domain knowledge gaps. So by specifically providing information within OBD, the large language model is more prepared to answer our questions. Lastly, there's also reduced hallucination. So hallucinations are a common problem within large language models when they uh, produce factually incorrect or fabricated information, uh, which is often due to uh, a lack of information, which can be accommodated for through retrieved relevant context. So this is an example of what a RAG LLM pipeline will look like. We'll start by taking a user query and transforming it into an embedding using our selected transformer model. We'll then perform semantic search, comparing it with the embeddings within our vector database and retrieve the top n most similar uh, context chunks. These context chunks are then uh, prompted with the large language model. Uh, and then finally, the response is delivered to the user. Okay, so um, we can enhance this bare bones RAG LLM pipeline um, with a few simple techniques. So um, I'll just make a note that all three of these techniques, they sort of rely on making a new independent call to an LLM. So first, for example, we have query augmentation, where we essentially ask the LLM to rewrite the initial user query uh, and improve, improve upon it. Then we have our context free ranker, um, which essentially re-ranks the results uh, based on their context and before they're sent to the LLM for generating a new response. And then um, we can also have a final response editor, which um, essentially edits the LLM's initial response uh, and checks for readability and appropriateness of the response uh, and then feeds a final um, response to the user. So what that looks like on a diagram is um, right here. So for example, um, after the user query, you can have an LLM query augmenter step. And um, after the search retrieval, um, you can feed it into the LLM re-ranker. And then finally, um, on the initial response, you can feed it into a response editor LLM. So with our fully working vector database and reg LLM, we're capable of powering uh, these various features here. 
Our specific Reg LLM will focus on question answering, which contributes back to our overall project goals of improving open by default by enhancing search performance and enabling user interaction. This is a demonstration of our MVP of our Reg LLM. So as you can see, users can enter a question at the bottom. This question is then converted into an embedding and compared with the vectors within our database. Once that context is retrieved, we'll feed it to our large language model. It'll then produce a response like shown here. As you can see, uh, the LLM is capable of producing an answer to the question. And in addition, it also provides caveats and follow-up questions that the user can ask. On the right side, there are references to the documents that the large language model quoted. And then at the bottom, there's a downloadable CSV file that contains the relevant text chunks. To evaluate our reg pipeline, we developed a sample set of queries taken from IJF staff and reporters and expanded this test set synthetically using a large language model. We then fed these queries to our basic reg pipeline to generate a response and then uh, scored these responses on various metrics. As a caveat, scoring is inherently subjective for reg LLMs and currently there's no gold standard uh, for determining if an answer or a response is um, good or not. So for our project, we decided to use an automated Python framework called Regus, which essentially provides metrics to evaluate reg given the prompt, context, response, and ground truth um, from the reg LLM. So one of the metrics that Regus is capable of uh, calculating is answer relevance, which looks at how relevant the gener generated answer is to the prompt. Um, the next Metric is faithfulness, which measures how factually consistent the response is against the given context. There's also context recall that specifically focuses on calculating the retrieval aspect of the reg LLM and asks, does the reg LLM retrieve all the information required to answer the question? And lastly, aspect critique, which can measure harmfulness, bias, conciseness, and understandability of the response. Moving on to our future directions and recommendations for our project. So one of our top priorities for improvement is um, improving the reliability of the RAG LLM, specifically in the context of safety. So we would recommend using safety classifications to implement a, par a prompt guard against malicious user instructions that are designed to over override the safety and security standards for um, LLMs. So essentially, we plan to apply models that are fine-tuned on user queries against RAG LLMs to specifically detect harmful user inputs. Um, given a user query, the model will say, yes, this is safe, or it is unsafe. And if it is unsafe, it will return the type of hazard. You can see the different categories for the hazards on the screen. Um, and in the case that a user query has been tagged as hazardous, the RAG LLM will refuse to generate a response. The next future direction we'd suggest for this project is implementing hybrid search, which combines the current search methodology that the IGF uses with the new search methodology that we've implemented, which is vector search. While keyword search focuses on ranking based on exact matches between the query and the documents, and vector searches um, focus on ranking based on cosine similarity, hybrid search actually merges both results to capture the strengths of both search methods and in doing so, it identifies the results that are both directly and contextually relevant to the user's query, while ideally minimizing misses and irrelevant suggestions. As you can see, this works in a similar format to our normal reg pipeline. However, instead of just delivering the user query to the vector database for semantic search, we'll also compare it to the raw text data to look at uh, where keyword density is maximized and then feed both results to the large language model. So finally, we also hope that our work can be uh, extended to other IGF databases. So as you can see here, the IGF, IGF has a wide array of other um, databases, and we think that our work would particularly be valuable for the political donors and the lobbying registrations data. Um, this is because it would help capture semantic meaning and efficiently retrieve more appropriate um, results uh, and documents, as well as it would help um, identify any hidden relationship ships within the databases. So um, just to summarize our project overall this summer, so first we began with 
um, improving the optical character recognition or OCR of the of the PDFs in the OBD database. Then we moved on to building our vector database, uh, which essentially allows us to index and search the documents better. Then we moved on to topic modeling for generating tags and labels. And then finally, we built our uh, retrieval augmented generation LLM pipeline, um, which searches the vector database and then generates a response to a user's query. So overall, through the collaboration between the Data Science for Social Good program and the Investigative Journalism Foundation, our project makes Open by Default more accessible and easier to use. Ultimately, our project intends to increase transparency and promote accountability of Canadian government organizations and representatives. And in doing so, we hope that our project has benefited IJF in their mission of strengthening Canada's democracy by driving transparent, data-driven reporting. This is a benefit not only for IGF journalists, but for Canadians across the country. Thank you everyone for listening to our presentation. We'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge all of the people that have supported us throughout this project and many others who we weren't able to include in the list.